everyone to another ESO build video. Today it's going to be the update to the Murder of Fire, the Stamina Dragon Knight for the Harrow Storm DLC. Now, yes, there is another Stam DK on my channel. That one is called Toxicity. That's for the more advanced player. This one is kind of an all-rounder. It's really good throughout content, for all content in fact, but it's a lot, lot easier to use and it's a lot easier to get some of the stuff as well. So if you like loads of fireworks and simple to use rotations, plus being a benefit to your group as well, without diminishing your ability to perform this is probably for you now first of all we're going to go into the stats now there is a few changes you can apply here but we'll go over those in a moment first of all we are sitting on 10k max magicka 16.4k max health and 31.9k max stamina with 1511 recovery 147 percent crit with 4221 weapon damage that does go up by the way once we start hitting combat because of course we've got bonuses and buffs from that now you can change some stuff here we've got 64 points into max stamina of course because our health is actually pretty good but if you do feel like you're a little bit too squishy then of course you can change your food we're actually using lava foot stuff which is basically flat stam and recovery no health whatsoever but if you want the extra health, you can, of course, use Arteum Takeaway Broth, which will do this. This will basically put you into a position where you now have 20.7k health. We've dipped a little in the stam, so your overall damage output will go down a little bit. But we have, of course, got much, much more health. And we'll pop a potion as well, because that's just fell off. Make sure we can still see our stats. We've got 1.2k recovery instead of 1.5. And, of course, everything else is pretty much the same. Again, if you choose to change again and you want some more flat stuff and you're comfortable heavy attack and you don't need the extra recovery, you can, of course, use the very straightforward flat stuff, max health, max stamina, and you'll sit on 23k health with 32 almost k stamina. 31.9, in fact, the same as we had before. You've lost recovery, but you've got a massive amount of health. Now, we can change this around a bit, of course, with health glyphs and stamina glyphs and all that good stuff. We're mostly using this food, which is the, the basic flat stamina and flat recovery, which is nice. But remember, you are a bit squishier. We have put two health glyphs on our armor to accommodate this. But if you're using the flat stuff or maybe if you're using the Arteum stuff, you can actually drop those two glyphs and put them back to stamina. In which case, it will put us around a 33-34k mark for stamina, which is really, really nice. But for now, this is the flat setup. You can change that and we'll get into that more when we get to the gear. We are, of course, a stage 4 vampire. We'll get to that in the passives. And we're using the Lover Mundus Stone for a very good reason. We're not using the Shadow. And that will, again, become more apparent once we get to the skills and the gear. It did actually outperform slightly for this particular build for reasons. Now, of course, I will now go into the skills. I'll explain every single one of them, where they come from, what morphs you want to take and why and what they do and all that good stuff. But if you do skip this section, which you're more than welcome to do so and you ask questions in the comment section below that I've already answered in the video, those comments will not be responded to because I'm not going to answer the same question twice. All the information is here. Skipping is at your own risk. Now, first of all, we are using Venomous Claw. This is very straightforward. A single target damage over time ability from Ardent Flame skill line. Second ability to unlock starts off as Seer and Strike Morph to Venomous Claw. Attach this to the target. Don't spam it. It does an initial hit, and then it does a damage over time for 14 seconds, and every two seconds it does damage, it will increase by 20% from the previous tick. So it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. If you spam this, you just keep resetting it. If you apply it once and leave it running until you need to reapply it, then you'll get the most out of it. Very simple, straightforward. Put it on the target and leave it running. Also, bear in mind, this does apply a guaranteed poison status effect on cast. So the target will be affected with a six second damage over time poison effect. That's helpful when it comes to our passives. We'll get to those later. Next up is, of course, Trap Beast which is morphed, of course, to Barb Trap. This is in the Fighter's Guild skill line. Last ability to unlock, starts off as Trap Beast, morphed to Barb Trap. This goes on the ground, under the target. It does physical damage initially, and then does an 18-second damage over time in the form of physical damage as well. And it gives us minor force, increasing all of our critical damage done by 10%. Now, you can immobilize targets with this on the initial hit, but if it's a boss, it obviously can't be immobilized. Don't worry, even if the target can't be immobilized or if they're CC'd, you still get the minor force and you still get the damage output. Keep this on a target at all times. Next, of course, Consuming Trap. This is in a Soul Trap skill line. You get this at the very beginning of the game. No excuses whatsoever. Starts off as Soul Trap. Morph it to Consuming Trap. This has two different effects. If you have high Magicka output uh, damage-wise, so you have Spell Damage and Magicka Pull, this will obviously 
benefit that instead. You'll do magic damage. But if you have high physical damage output, so high weapon damage and high stamina over the other pool, so one higher than the other, it will do physical damage instead. So for us, this does the physical damage proportion. It's a 10 second damage over time, much like Venomous Claw, keep it on your target. Don't spam it. However, if the target affected by this dies, you will get back 20% of all of your resources. That's a heal, that's magic back, and that's stamina back. So yes, you can apply this to multiple targets and get a big burst of stuff back all at once. Next is Stone Giant. This is very simple, although some people have been struggling with this. And this is going to make a lot more sense when we get to the rotation. But this particular skill has been changed over the last few patches. It starts off as Stone Fist, morph it into Stone Giant. Now this does have a channel time on the initial hit, which is 0.6 seconds. So no, you can't bar swap or animation cancel, and if you do try to, it will cancel the skill and or stop you doing whatever you're doing. That's very important. You do have to consider the initial cast. Now, once it's active, it will last for 12 seconds as a kind of a buff to you. It will do initial error of effect damage as well. And during those 12 seconds, you can actually apply stagger to the target. Now, the way to do this is to fire another one, which is an insta-cast. And you can fire them up to three times, and the final one will stun the target. But while stagger is on the target, you will increase the damage taken to that target for six seconds by 65. So everybody hitting that target will increase each damage skill they are doing by that amount. So the target is basically debuffed. Now, all you need to do is keep this up. So you have the initial cast, which is air of effect. You have 12 seconds to fire off stagger, which is easy. In our rotation, we're going to have it up 100% of the time. Don't worry. But basically, you activate three casts, activate three casts. This is going to be very easy to apply, although at the moment it's going to look a little bit complicated. Don't worry, that will be explained when we get to the rotation later on in the video. Rendon Slashes next, it's in our dual wield skill line. Second ability to unlock, starts off as twin slashes, morph it to Rendon Slashes. This is very much like Venomous Claw, except it does physical damage, not poison. And this puts a single target damage over time on the target with an initial hit as well. Now there's two morphs to this. Rendon Slashes has a stronger initial hit. Um, Blood Craze has exactly the same damage over time, but a slightly lesser initial hit, and it will heal you while the damage over time is active. So if you are feeling a little squishy and you feel like you need an extra heal, you can of course change this morph. You'll get a slight decrease in overall DPS, not even enough to really notice in content, but you will benefit from the heal that comes from it. So the choice is yours on that particular morph. Of course, if you do choose to, you can swap out Rendon Slashes for Word and Blaze if you want a little bit of Execute Power. This particular ability starts off as Whirlwind, morph it to Whirl and Blades, and this is basically your spin to win. When targets are under 50% health, honestly I'd go for 25 and under, you will deal extra damage to enemies and you basically just execute things in area of effect. That will alter your rotation if you choose to use this, but again, we will get to that later. For now, keep it simple and keep this on. Flawless Dawnbreaker is on our front bar ultimate. This is from the Fighters Guild skill. I need Fighters Guild level 10 for this. Starts off as Dawnbreaker, morph it to Flawless Dawnbreaker. This does do a decent amount of damage in front of you. It hits initially, it does damage over time for 6 seconds, and it does increase your weapon damage by 300 for 20 seconds, which is pretty huge. But this is our oh shit ultimate. We only use this if we're really low on resources, or the enemy's almost dead and we don't have enough for the back bar ultimate. This is mostly here for passives overall, but we'll get to that in a bit as well. Just bear in mind, of course, you cannot bar swap this ability. You have to let it cast, otherwise you'll just cancel it completely and it won't fire. It has a 0.4 second cast time. Now, Molten Whip is on our back bar for a very good reason. And I'm just going to explain quickly what that is. You don't have to have this on your bar if you don't want to. It's in the Ardent Flame skill line. Starts off as Lava Whip, morph it to Molten Whip. It's the first ability to unlock. We never activate this. If we have this on our bar, only on our back bar for the time being, because we don't put it on both of them. Every time we cast an Ardent Flame ability, we will gain 75 weapon damage and spell damage for 5 seconds, which can stack up to 3 times. We do have 2 abilities on this bar that are considered for this particular bonus, and while those 5 seconds are ticking over, yes you can swap bars and it will carry over, it will stay with you for the duration. So we're just using it for the weapon damage bonus as a tiny boost. You don't have to have this if you don't want to. You can sacrifice a small amount of weapon damage and instead put on a heal, which I would personally recommend. And what you want to do there is you've got two major choices. The first one is in Assault, which is Vigor and morph it to Echoing Vigor. Now this particular morph I choose on purpose. One, because it heals other people in Air of Effect. 
two because of sustain. The other version lasts five seconds and gives you the same heal but over that period of time rather than stretching it over ten. It ticks every one second instead of every two. But these do stack. So while I'm receiving this heal, I can stand next to somebody else who is also um, casting this and both of our heals stack on top of each other. So effectively, we've both cast the other Vigor, but we've got a 10 second duration on it. If you have multiple stamina stacking up and they all fire this at once, you've got some incredible air of effect heals going out there and it really helps your group. So I prefer this one. Now, the other heal you can have is actually in the Fighters Guild skill line, and this is called Circle of Protection. Morph it to Ring of Preservation. This goes on the ground, gives everyone minor protection who are standing inside of it. It gives a minor endurance as well, so they've got actually reduction to damage and increase to recovery. And at the same time, they are healed every half a second. And this is a rapid heal, but it's bloody expensive, so do not spam it. But this is kind of an oh shit heal. This does have a very... Uh, relevant passive apply to it which we'll get to in the passive section if you choose to use this over vigor but this is kind of a stack and burn situation rather than something that has to be used on the move so you've got a flat damage bonus here you've got a standing still mitigation recovery and heal bonus here plus a damage bonus from your passives which we'll get to in a bit like I said or you've got the other version of your basic heal which is of course echoing vigor these are choices that you can make. I personally preference this one. If you watch me on the live stream, you can see clearly that I use this all the time. Now, next up is Poison Injection. This is in the bow skill line. It's the last one you unlock. It does take some time, but once you've got Poison Arrow, morph it to Poison Injection. This is a single target damage over time to the target in the form of Poison Damage. And, of course, it has an initial hit as well. However, this is not just a single target damage over time. This escalates the lower the target's health. So if you keep this on the target all the time, this will help you with your build, by the way, because we do have a weapon utilizing this. Once it starts going lower, you will do up to 100% more damage. So you don't have to actually change any skills for execute or any of that stuff. It just passively does it for you. So keep this up. Next up, of course, is Flames of Oblivion. This is in the Ardent Flame skill line. This also takes some time to unlock. It's the last ability in the skill line. It starts off as Inferno, morph it to Flames of Oblivion. Very simply put, you activate it and it lasts 15 seconds and it costs Magicka. So although this does cost magic... This does do fire damage, but it scales off of our highest offensive stat. So our highest offensive stat is weapon damage and stamina. So it obviously escalates from that. If you had high uh, mag and spell damage, then of course it would scale off of that instead. Now, yes, this is fire damage. So yes, this does follow the rules of magic or spell penetration, not physical, regardless of it scaling off our physical. But we have that covered. When we get to our overall setup, champion points and gear... I'm going to go over this some more and explain a bit more about it. But for having it on your bar, you do get Major, and Ma Major Prophecy and Savagery for free. But we've got it in our potions anyway for Savagery. And of course, every five seconds, it fires one fireball at a single target or two fireballs at two different targets if we have them. So you'll only see two if there are two targets. The rest of the time, you just see the one. But this is really nice. It's not damage over time. It's direct damage, but it is a durated effect. So just make sure you cast this every one rotation and you'll be just fine. Next is Stone Giant. Again, yes, we double barred it. This will make sense in the rotation. Take my word for it there. We're moving on. Arrow Barrage is a choice. This is in the bow skill line. Second ability unlock. Starts off as Volley Morpher to Arrow Barrage. This is a very strong area of effect damage over time ability See that you must keep up 100% of the time if you can. It only lasts for 8 seconds. Although the duration is 10, 2 seconds of that is actually the wind-up delay. Now, you can, if you choose to, if your rotation is not on point, choose the other morph, which is Endless Hail, and that actually lasts for 14 seconds. So the duration of the actual damage is 12. So that's a lot, lot safer to close the gap if you're not very good at the rotation, but you will sacrifice damage output to do so. That actually does sometimes benefit people, so the choice is yours. But you need a variation of this skill no matter what. If I ever say body, I just mean this skill, which morph you take is your choice. But just bear in mind, of course, we do have weapon glyphs on our back bar. And damage over time in area of effect, if it's a weapon skill, can continuously fire a glyph every time it's off cooldown. So that is why you need to keep this up. Our main ultimate is Standard of Might. This is in the Ardent Flame skill line. This is very important. You put a banner down on the ground. It does 20 seconds worth of flame damage every one second to anyone caught inside of it. It does apply major to far, reducing the heal and receive of the targets, which is not that important for PvE, but it can benefit in some situations. But the most important thing here, apart from the synergy that you can get from it, because other people can immobilize targets nearby and do a big flame burst damage from taking the synergy, while standing inside of this, all of your damage is increased by 15%. And all the damage you take is reduced by 15%. So you're tankier and you hit harder. This is our main ultimate. It's very expensive. We do use this as much as possible. 
This one on the front is here for stats and oh shit situations. This is the one you want to use all the time. Bear in mind, of course, when we get to the passives, it's going to make a lot more sense as to how you should apply this. It's not just drop it and go. You do need to make sure you've got some damage already running because then it can benefit from the bonus straight away rather than dropping it and then having to wind up all your skills. Now, this is a flex slot, of course, because you can change to another ultimate if you feel a little bit squishy or maybe if you just prefer it. Maybe you're in a lot of pugs, maybe you die a lot or maybe you just like this skill. Corrosive Armor is your other option in the Earth and Heart skill line. This starts off as Magma Shell or Magma Armor, as you just saw. Morph it to Corrosive Armor. This is a cheaper ultimate, lasts for 12 seconds, and you basically can't die for a period of time. Give or take mechanics, because some are one-shots. If you get hit, you will only be hit for a maximum of 3% of your max health. So you're very, very hard to kill. With your small amount of damage and area of effect as well, and... While this is active, all of your direct damage abilities ignore physical resistance. Now, this initial hit from Poison Injection, Stone Giant, Venomous Claw, Beast Trap, and Rendon Slashes, all of their direct damage application, the initial hits, and this one all the time, will actually benefit from that. So it's as if the target has no resistances whatsoever. And if you're using Spin to win at the time, so the uh, Whirl and Blades, if you're using that for Execute, that gives you some really hard hit and spins. So this is a protective bonus and a bit of a damage bonus depending on the situation if you prefer to use this. If you're using this for Maelstrom, by the way, I would highly recommend Corrosive Armor. If you're in Pugs, I would recommend it as well. But for the most part, if you're comfortable in content and you just want to get extra damage out, this will benefit everything that you do. Now we're going to get into passives. These are very important, so do pay attention. Now, combustion is stupidly important. This increases the damage of your burn and poison status effects we are using fire damage here and with our ultimate and with our setup itself as well which is coming in the gear so we can get burn and status effects if we're lucky to apply and in doing so we will get back 500 extra magicka and the burn and status effect will do 50 percent more damage every time it applies you can get 500 magic back that's helpful because two of our abilities here consuming trap and flames of oblivion both cost magicka now, although that helps our stam sustain, because we've got two abilities that do damage that don't cost stamina, we can even get more of that back if we get lucky with status effects here. Not to mention, of course, the poison status effects also scale in the same manner. They do have more damage output if you apply them, and instead of magicka back, like you get on the burning status effects, you get stamina back. Every new poison or new burning status effect will give you one of those two back with no cooldown. Venomous Claw applies a poison status effect straight away. So this looks like it costs us 1641. It actually costs us 1141 because we get 500 back straight away. Also, Poison Injection is poison as well. Either of these two skills can actually apply a poison status effect at any moment in time, and our poisons on our weapons can. So we can always benefit from that 500 return and the increased damage if it happens. This is a really powerful passive, very important indeed. When you deal direct damage with an Ardent Flame ability, you reduce the enemy's movement speed. Now, Venomous is direct initially, and Flames of Living is direct all the time, so those two will benefit. Increase the damage over time of your Fiery Breath, Searing Strike, and Dragon Knight standard abilities by 33%, and the duration by 4 seconds. So that benefits this, and of course our banner. Now we're not using Noxus Breath, but you can choose to if you want. This wasn't in the flex slot options, but you can of course put it here. But that will mean that your front bar rotation will change. I will explain that in the rotation itself, if you need to do that. Next up, of course, is increases your flame damage area of effect abilities. So that counts to our banner. And, of course, decreases the cost of all your poison abilities. So, as you can see, Venomous Claw is already cheap anyway. That's because of that passive. And Poison Injection is very cheap. That's because of that passive. Draconic Power, we're not really using any of these, apart from a couple of base passives that we do need. This increases the amount of damage you can block, so you want to get that. And this increases your spell resistance, so you want to get that. This increases your healing received if you're using the draconic power ability at the time we're not really using any so you don't need this passive unless of course you choose to put on a resistance buff somewhere in which case you can do this increases your health recovery by five percent for each draconic power ability slotted now we don't have any you could have one but the health recovery bonus is kind of negative anyway because we are a vampire and our health recovery sucks but the second part of this skill is why well, you do want it no matter what this increases the range of your melee attacks by 2 meters if they are 5 meter range abilities, if they're insta-cast. So, Venomous Claw, Rend and Slashes are light attacks and heavy attacks are all um, melee-based abilities that are 5 meters, and this is 
going to contribute to that. So we don't actually have to stand in the face of the enemy. We can stand back a bit and still reach. Earthen Heart is essential. This increases the duration of your Earthen Heart abilities. That is why this duration here is 12 seconds and not 10. As the same with this one as well. So they're important. Make sure you get that. This gives you resources back. If you use an ultimate, every ultimate cost point will give you 46 of all three resources back. So the more expensive the ultimate, the more stuff we get. And this is why you shouldn't use your banner or any ultimate with a full bar. If you have full resources and you activate an ultimate, you gain nothing back because you're already full. You need to spend resources, put your skills down, get some damage going, then use an ultimate to claim it back. Be very careful with this passive. It's incredibly important. And if you misuse it, then you could find yourself in trouble when it comes to your sustain. This is to give you stuff back. Don't just waste it. When you cast an Earthen Heart ability, you and your group get minor brutality for 20 seconds, increasing your weapon damage by 10%. We have Stone Fist, and we're using it all the time, or Stone Giant. This will be up 100% of the time. It's a buff to your group. And every 6 seconds, if we use one of these abilities, we will get 3 ultimate back. So our ulti regen is up as well. Help and Hands is actually very important when you cast a non-stamina ability from the Earthen Heart skill line. You will get 990 stamina back. So if you're in Maelstrom, for example, and you choose to use Igneous Shields, which I do quite a lot... Or if you use your ultimate or anything like that, you'll get an additional 990 stamina back. Just bear in mind, if you do use this, there's no cooldown for this. You can just spam it and you will get juice back. But you'll probably run out of magicka before that's really, really effective. But it's quite nice. Situations permitting, obviously, that's a handy passive. So you do want that. doesn't apply to Stone Fist, but it does apply to all the rest. Dual Wield, of course. We do want every single one of these. This increases the damage of your Dual Wield abilities against enemies by 20% if they're under 25% health. So all of these abilities, any that you use, including this execute, it does get stronger, yes, if their health is lower, all count, including your light and heavy attacks. This increases the weapon damage of your offhand weapon. Offhands are weaker than main hand, so this helps. This reduces the cost of dual world abilities, if you use them, of course, which we are using one, that helps. This will give you a 15% damage bonus against stunned, immobilized, disorient, or silenced enemies with those weapon types. This gives you bonuses based on what weapons you're wearing, or using, or holding, or whatever. Each one will give you this bonus, and it will obviously stack up if you use two of the same. We're using one axe for this bleed, this 8% chance to do a damage over time bleed, and we're using one sword to increase our overall damage by 3%. We're not using daggers, we're not using the shadow for crit damage, so we're not too bothered about our crit because most of our stuff is actually flat. But we're going to get to that, like I said, in a moment when we get to the gear. Bow is important, of course. This gives you a damage bonus of up to 12%. Um, with bow abilities for enemies that are at longer range. So if you're on the run-up to a fight or inside mechanics, your lights, your heavies, your bow skills will all be stronger. This increases your weapon crit rating while on that bar. This reduces the cost of the abilities because they're quite expensive. This is very important. If you do a light attack or a heavy attack, you'll get 5 seconds worth of 5% increase to your bow damage. If you fire another light attack or a heavy attack within that timer, it will give you another stack. And it will stack up to 5 times. We'll probably get 3 or 4 at most and then obviously when we swap bars eventually it'll fall off but you do want this passive nonetheless don't miss your light attacks it is important for the extra damage output this grants you major expedition if you dodge roll which increases your movement speed for with by 30 percent this is only on your bow bar by the way no bow equip is your parameter or rule for that now we're not using um a massive amount of light and heavy but we will get some of the passives anyway we are using of course five medium so you want every single one of these this will increase your weapon crit rating for each piece worn. This will increase your stamina recovery and reduction to cost for stamina abilities. This will reduce the cost of sneak and detection size, which isn't massively important, but you might want it for some content. This increases your weapon damage by 15%, and this increases your movement speed while sprinting, and also reduces the cost of dodge roll. Light armor, we are wearing one piece, so for this you want a couple of passives. You want this one that reduces the effectiveness of snares against you and reduces the cost of sprint for the one piece we have on. This increases your mag recovery and reduces the cost of magicka abilities. We are actually using two, so we do want that recovery and reduction to cost. And this will give you a nice spell resistance bonus. This here and this here requires five pieces of light. You don't need them. Heavy armor, of course, you just want the three top passives. These two require five pieces, so they're irrelevant. This increases your resistances by a small amount for each piece worn, which is one, but it's physical and spell resistance. This increases your health recovery, which is not that important, but you do restore 108 magicka and stamina when you take damage once every four seconds based on how many pieces you're wearing. So this does actually help us with our sustain a small amount. And this increases your max health by 2% for having the one piece worn as well. Now, 
We are, of course, a stage four vampire. I'm stage four vampire in all content. Yes, I'm very aware that vampire is due to change in the future, but we're not in the future yet. We are in the now, and this is how it works at the moment. So you want this passive for stage two or higher, which will increase your mag recovery and your stam recovery by 10% flat out. You don't need any extra skills in a bar. You just need to be stage two or higher. And undef, the lower your health goes under 50%, the less damage you take. You can actually have up to a 33% damage mitigation bonus, and you must be stage three or higher to receive this. I'm stage four all the time. You don't have to be if you don't want to, but honestly, personally, I don't struggle with it in content. Most people that stand in fire tend to die from it anyway, whether you're a vampire or not. But I know people are scared of that. So if you want to change stuff, that's up to you. But I personally preference just stay in stage four throughout for now. Fighters Guild, of course, you are going to want these. These passives are important, especially if you're using Ring of Preservation on your back bar for your heal because it gives you a bonus. Now, this reduces the cost of your um, Fighters Guild ability. So if you're using Beast Trap, which we are, it's cheaper. And of course, if you're using this, it's cheaper. This increases your weapon damage by 3% for each Fighters Guild ability slotted. Why is this on our bar for passives? Because that gives us 3% extra weapon damage, as does Beast Trap. Our back bar, if we are using Ring of Preservation, this will give us 3% on that bar. So instead of using the whip that gives us 75 weapon damage per Ardent Flame ability fired, and then it swaps over and then it runs out, this gives us a 3% bonus just while we're on the bar for the duration that we're there. So that does benefit you a little bit. Now this one's very important. When you kill Undead Daedra or Werewolf, you'll get 9 ultimate for the privilege of killing them. Each one that you kill will give you 9 ultimate. You do actually have to be the one that finishes them off. Your Fighter's Guild abilities deal an additional 20% extra damage versus Undead Daedra or Werewolves. That is going to benefit this quite a substantial amount. Make sure you get it. Major Guild is no good. Undaunted. You do want these. Activating an Allies Synergy restores resources. What a surprise. 4% health, stamina, and magic back for any synergy that you take in the game, no matter what they do as a bonus on top of that. Now, there is a video in the description for synergies. It's one of the How to Get Good video series um, editions. So if you are confused about any of that stuff, it is all explained there. And I even demonstrate how you can use it in combat without slowing down your rotation or even negatively impacting your overall DPS output. Synergies will benefit you no matter what make sure you take them and it can help you sustain so much more if you do so because this is a free bonus on top Now we are using three different types of armor We're using five pieces of medium armor We're using one piece of light armor and one piece of heavy and because we're using three different types We get a 2% bonus to all resources for each one So we've got an extra 6% health magic and stamina get this passive. It's really useful Now we are of course an orc you don't have to be but we are on you can be Imperial, Nord, Khajiit, even Dark Elf. You can be anything you want. It's entirely up to you. But I've deliberately chosen to be an Orc because I like the flat stamina bonus that we get here. Also the max health bonus that we get, which is pretty helpful. And when you deal damage with a weapon ability once every four seconds, you'll actually heal off it. And you can crit with that as well. And yes, that applies to your dots. So your damage over time from your bow will heal you as well as your lights and heavies and all that from your dual wield. doesn't matter as long as it's weapon ability. And you get a flat increase to your weapon damage. Reduction to cost for sprint and movement speed increase. So we're fast. We hit hard. We heal from damage. Nice health. Good flat stamina as well. Very good choice all round. But like I said, if you want to change your race and be something else, you're more than welcome to do so. Just consider your passive differences and what you might have to plug in order to make it fit. One more passive. This is the most important one in the game, in my opinion. We are using weapon damage, weapon crit, and recovery potions. They are expensive. You want to make the most out of them. Potions are consumable buffs. You wouldn't let your buffs run out? Don't let your potions run out. Use them all the time. And for having this bonus here, your potions will last 30% longer. Crafted potions, especially the ones we're using, actually last 47 seconds instead of the cooldown, which is 45. So we have 100% uptime on them. If you don't have this passive, your potions will only last for, uh, 36. So much, much less time. And of course, your damage output will suffer and so will your recovery because you've got a 10 second gap almost every single time you take a potion where... You're not benefiting. So do get this passive. Now we're going to get into the gear. So first of all, there are some options. You can change stuff around. And we're also going to explain why things are set up the way they are. Unfathomable Darkness, Axe, and Sword. We're not using the Shadow Mundus Stone. We're not really benefiting from a lot of crit. So we'll just take the crit that we've got. And not necessarily try to over push it. So instead of using a dagger, we're using a sword for the flat damage output. Which will actually help towards our procs as well. Unfathomable Darkness actually does give us a crit bonus, a penetration bonus, and of course a weapon damage bonus. And when you deal damage, you have a 10% chance, any damage by the way, 
to call a murder of crows for 12 seconds and every three seconds one crow will be attacking the target closest to you within 12 meters and deal 5.5k damage that escalates of course with buffs and bonuses and penetrating values and this can happen once every 15 seconds so you only have a three second gap but since they fire every three seconds anyway you can essentially have 100 percent uptime on the bonus this is actually a very active um proc so we do have it on the weapons on purpose by the way because with it being a duration if we swap bars it stays up you don't have to have it on the back bar you need to proc it on the front yes but you don't have to have it on the back bar because you can keep it up now if you do swap the weapons around of course you will see a fluctuating uh, effect sometimes it'll be in your favor sometimes it won't this is obviously a lot more accurate but you want the two weapons on the front and you want the jewelry if you can get it failing that you can put three body pieces on instead it's entirely up to you where you put the pieces but the weapons must be on the front bar now we're using two blood firsty and one infused on the jewelry you do not want these on the back bar if you do not have the next weapon that i'm going to show you then just put a crafted weapon or agility weapon on the back bar to give you increased stats you won't benefit from putting this on both bars we are using the master's bow to give us as much damage single target for this particular build as possible now if you have the maelstrom bow that's fine it will do less damage single target but your error of effect will be up a little bit and if you don't have either of these you can of course put agility or a crafted one on the back for the time being and you will be just fine but you want it infused with a weapon and spell damage glyph and you must keep up your poison injection if you put poison injection on a target that target will receive damage as though you have an extra 301 weapon damage for any target that you put a poison injection on this will be affected by that just bear in mind of course the front bar we are using double dot poisons so we've got two extra poison damage over times here which can both of course proc poison status effects which is quite helpful the monster set we're using is of course to theme the build and still bloody strong Vulcan scoria this will give you a health bonus, which is great. And when you deal damage with a damage over time effect, which we have loads of, we've got two in our poison um, procs. We've got one on our poison injection. We've got one from Volley. We've got one from Soul Trap. We've got one from Venomous Claw, Beast Trap, Rendon Slashes, and of course our ultimate, if you count that as well. Not to mention the burn and status effect, and of course a poison status effect. So we've actually got 11 active damage over time abilities at any one time. So this is going to fire, and it can fire every 5 seconds. It will hit the target initially with flame damage, and then do air of effect flame damage at the same time. This rapid firing um, proc gives you a nice health bonus. Win-win. Now, we want divines on all of our armor, by the way, before we go any further. And yes, I've got a health glyph on this because I'm using recovery food. You want a health glyph on your helmet and chest if you're using recovery food. If you're using flat food, you can take this off and replace them both with stamina, and you'll get a little bit more flat damage output. It's entirely up to you. Helmet and shoulder can be light or medium, in, uh, light or heavy in any order, doesn't matter which, because regardless of which slot they're in, each weight will have the same resistance as any weight. So heavy here, giving us 2425, in a shoulder will give us the same. Light here, giving us 1221, in here will give us the same. Put them in any order you want. The other set we're using is Red Mountain. Now this you do want on your overall character 100% of the time. You want it either on the body or the body and the jewelry, whichever you can mix this into, because this does not fire while you're on an opposite bar. So you want it with you all the time so you never fall off of cooldown and all that good stuff. So this will give us a weapon damage bonus, stamina bonus, and a crit bonus. And when you deal damage with a weapon ability, only weapon abilities, light attack, heavy attack, dots, volley, poison injection, all that good stuff, only those will fire this. You have a 10% chance to spawn a volcano on the ground, which after one second will fire a flame attack at the target, which hits really bloody hard, and this can happen once every two seconds. So this can proc every second tick of volley if you're lucky. It's stupidly powerful. And yes, very clearly put, this is flame damage. So this is flame, this is flame, flames of oblivion is flame, our banner is flame. You can see we've got a lot of fire damage, but obviously that doesn't scale off of physical penetration. That scales off of spell penetration, which is why we're using the Lover's Stone. We have altered our champion points and our traits and everything like that to make sure that we can still hit cap physical penetration, but we've got an additional 1.4k spell penetration on top of what we would ever get in any content, which means these abilities on our setup are stronger than they ever were before. The actual flat damage output difference between the Shadow and the Lover was actually quite a bit of difference because of this alteration. So this is why we've chosen it. Now, there are options, of course. So to quickly go over them again, Unfathomable Darkness weapons and then three pieces. 
Masters or Maelstrom bow on the back. Or agility if you don't have it. Valken Scoria, helmet and shoulders. Red Mountain on the body. Divines on everything. Now, you can change this out to Reliquin if you prefer, if you are a little bit more advanced. This is absolutely fine. You will get more damage out of it if you can keep your light attacks up. If you can't keep your light attacks up and you can't keep these procs up for the 20 stacks that they gain and then consistently stay with them, then this set is useless to you and you're actually doing less damage. Because instead of having a, a 10k proc every 2 seconds, if you're lucky, you are actually doing nothing. No benefit at all. So this is actually very, very powerful. And especially if you are inexperienced, this will outperform. But if you're very experienced and you can keep up those procs rather than just humping the dummy and showing the numbers, actually using it in content, if you can do it, Reliquin will be better for you. This, by the way, this 10k escalates stupidly. It goes up to about 18 to 20k sometimes. Um, the other option is, of course, Alkosh. If you are taking synergies a lot, and you should be, this set here, every synergy you take will do damage and area of effect in front of you. It will add a damage over time effect to all targets in front of you, up to six in fact, and it will reduce their physical and spell resistance by 3010 for 10 seconds. Every synergy that you take will stack on top of another. The resistance and um, debuff doesn't stack, it will just refresh, but the dots stack. If you take 10 synergies, you've got 10 dots. That's a stupid amount of damage. Free up time on the debuff. And every single dot, remember, can fire Valken Scoria. The more you've got, the more that fires, the more damage you do. It's win-win. So, flat out, Red Mountain. If you're really experienced, Reliquin's great. If you are helpful towards your group and you can keep up synergies in your rotation, you can sometimes get a lot more damage out of this than any of the other options. Depends what you preference. Now, we're going to get into the champion points, then I'm going to show you the rotation. So, red ones first. 72 in Ironclad to reduce the amount of direct damage you take. 64 and 64 into Hardy and Elemental Defender to reduce the amount of every damage type you take by 13%. And of course, 19% reduction to damage over time. These can all be changed if you prefer, depending on your content. Just bear in mind, of course, you do have other passives here. I put a video out recently in the How to Get Good series called Champion Points Explained. If you check that out, you'll see what all these do as well. They're very, very important. Do pay attention to these. That's link in the description. 90 points in quick recovery to make sure we have a 5% bonus to healing received. 44 into Warlord to reduce the cost of break free. 75 points into Tenacity and 75 points into Mooncalf. Tenacity is for your heavy attack return, although here it states differently. That is because we are on an off-patch test on PTS at the moment, and light and heavy attacks and the sustain for them has been somewhat altered. So this is not a very good... Uh, visual representation of what is on live at the moment. This is different on live. This will give you heavy attack return. So ignore this for now, but make sure you get the points in there so it will benefit you on the live servers. This stuff may not ever actually come through. There's a video about that as well, section below, that's already linked. 72 into tumbling to reduce the cost of dodge roll, and of course we've got four points left here. We're not doing anything with them, so we'll take advantage of this passive here. Increase quality of loot from chest. Nothing in here. 66 into Master Arms to increase the damage done with direct attacks. We do have a hell of a lot of those. This benefits them a lot, including the procs that we do. 11 points into Physical Weapons Expert to increase our light and heavy attacks. 66 into Fermatage. We do have a lot of damage over time. We have a lot of direct as well, so we've balanced those out to be exactly the same. 61 points into Crit Damage. We don't have the Shadow Mundestone, but we'll still take the benefit from this passive. We have 64 points into Mighty, increasing all of our physical damage that we do whether it be poison, disease, physical, whichever, any any of those types of damage is increased, whether it's dot, direct, or not. Two points into piercing to close the gap for the final amount of penetration we're ever going to need in any buff debuff situation. We have 1.4k with change on our Unfathomable Darkness set already. We don't need sharpened because we're using the Love of Stone. We have a lot of pen already covered, so we don't need this, and we can utilize for more flat. Now, how is that a benefit overall? So... We're already hitting cap if we have all the bonuses and buffs applied for physical. We've increased the damage over time that we can do. We've increased our physical and all the rest of it. And we've also increased our direct because it's all extra points. Most of our direct and some of our damage over time is actually flame damage. Now, to get any spell pen, we'd have to put loads and loads of points in here. Around 61-ish to get 4.4-ish spell pen out of it. We've got 4.1 spell pen from the lover stone already so we've benefited from these extra points here to not use here to give us a spell pen to make all of our flame procs do more damage so where that comes into play we did mention it briefly earlier our skills so flames of oblivion 
will benefit from our love of Mundestone, giving us more spell pen to make this stronger, even though it scales off our max stats, which are already really high. Flames of Oblivion is not the only one. We also have the banner as well. So the flame damage from this is scaled off of your max resources, but we can hit harder with it because we've already got the CP's plug and the actual damage output, and then we've got pen from it as well. If we didn't have that stone, we would be lacking 4k pen, and this would be lower once it hits. Also, in our sets, we have Valken Scoria, which is fire. We have Red Mountain, which is fire. They're all getting boosted by the particular setup or changes that we've made to this. It's really, really nice. Now, we're going to go into the rotation. This is actually quite simple. Stone Fist has scared a lot of people recently, and that's because they don't understand quite how to use it. Now, as you can see here, the initial hit from it is a stomp, and it's a 0.6 second channel. And you can't bar swap it. You can't do anything about it whatsoever. So what do you do? Well, what you do is you need to make sure that you never apply that stomp when you need to bar swap. So if you stomp and then light attack, it will fire. The channel doesn't affect your ability to light attack. It affects your ability to cancel. So we have the stomp on our back bar and we have the, the fast instant cast on the front. Now how that looks is like this. So instead of stomping and then bar swap, which we can't do, we stomp, use another ability, and then swap. Then the front one is instant anyway, and it works out just fine. Now we've used three, the buff is gone, we go to the back, we can do our stomp, ability, swap. That's it. What people keep trying to do is they're trying to do the stomp, then swap bars. You can't do that. So the rotation has been constructed in a manner that will actually allow for this. So what you need to do first of all, make sure your beast trap is always down. Sometimes in the run up to a fight, you want to throw a volley in first. Just make sure your beast trap gets in as soon as possible. Once you're in the fight, you want to make sure you do this. So volley, light poison injection, light stomp, light flames, drip, swap bars. Flames of oblivion, by the way, is flames. As you can see, all the, all the stuff is firing off. Now, when we get to the front bar, our stone fist timer is still running. And we need to wave in three stagger abilities, or three stagger stone fist. So what we do on the front bar is we light attack venom claw, light rendered slashes, light soul trap, and then stone fist three times with light attacks in between. Light one, light two, light three. Now yeah, there was a stomp in there, but we need to demonstrate that properly from the beginning because obviously our time is off there. During a demonstration, it's a little trickier. So. We'll start again from the back bar, and I will just repeat, 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 so you can see how active this actually is and how easy it is to apply once you get into the swing of it. So, volley, light poison, light stomp, light flames, swap, light venom, light rending, light soul trap, light one, light two, light three, light beast trap, swap, volley, light poison, light stomp, light flames, swap, dot one, dot two, dot three. This one, two, three, beast trap, swap. Volley, light, stomp is coming. Stomp is ready. Flames, swap. And you just repeat. Dot, dot, dot. Punch, punch, punch. Beast trap, swap. Stomp is ready. Stomp, flames, swap. Dot, dot, dot. Punch, punch, punch. Nice and easy. That's all you have to do. Your three spams on the front are guaranteed to make your whole skill run out, allowing you to do the stomp on your back bar, weave an ability in between, and swap with no fluidity issues whatsoever. Now, because the PTS is very different right now, it does actually show differences to lights and heavy attacks. Light attacks are reduced, heavy attacks are increased. Light attacks restore stamina, heavy attacks don't. That is not reflective of live right now. It's very different. It's a mid-patch, or not even a mid-patch, it's an off-patch test where Zoss has basically said, yeah, our QA team does stuff, do you want to get involved as well? They're showing us some extra stuff. It has no relevance to any patches whatsoever. So I can't demonstrate a full rotation as such and give you the exact um, numbers that you're going to receive in the normal here's a pass screenshot type stuff. So you can't see that on PTS at the moment. But on live, with... The standard setup that we're using here, you're looking at around the 70 to 75k mark if you can keep up your rotation and if you're lucky during execute. 
if you are using the Reliquin variation, instead of 70 pushing to 75, you're looking at more 80k-ish. So it varies depending on you, your rotation, and which variation of the two different setups you've taken. But it's absolutely fine for all content. You will not struggle with it. It's very easy to apply. So no, you're not getting a screenshot because otherwise it would be invalid because it would be fake showing what's on PTS at the minute because it's different. But it does work out very, very well. Basically the same as it was in the last update. It's still pretty much the same, but the rotation is a lot, lot easier to digest because now since Stone Fist changed, it's, it's explained basically for you. So, so those of you that were confused, hopefully that makes sense now. One more thing you can do, by the way, is if you do choose to add Noxus Breath, put it on your back bar. And if you choose to use Whirling Blades, put it on your front bar. Now this is if you choose these two skills specifically. If you don't and you still want to keep this double barred, that's fine. Your rotation doesn't change and you can spin at the end, but you can't add the extra dot, obviously. If you do use this on the back, then it will change a little. What you need to do for that is at the beginning of your front bar rotation, you need to light attack this and then put your two dots on. Light attack this three times. Beast Trap Swap. Volley, Light, Poison, Light, Breath, Light, Flames, Swap. Light Stomp, Dot, Dot, Three Punches. Then, when it gets to Execute, you just do the Stomp at the beginning of the rotation, with a couple of these, and then Spin to win. That's your variation if you choose to do that. That will be a bit complicated for some. Honestly, I would just stick to the standard rotation. There's barely anything in it, apart from a little bit of extra Execute power. So if you do choose to change for the Whirl and Blades option, you will need to do an extra punch on the front bar and it might get a little tricky. But if it does get tricky for you, you end up stomping on the front, do not panic. At the end of the day, as long as you don't bar swap when you do this, you're fine. And the rotation is already set up for you to fire this, then a beast trap, and then swap. And on your back bar, it's supposed to be this, then a flames, and then swap. So if you do choose to do an extra one punch on the front instead of a dot for the sake of putting Whirling Blades on, it shouldn't alter your rotation at all. You just miss one dot and add one more extra throw. Hopefully it wasn't too confusing, hopefully that helps, and don't forget of course the funnest part about this build is that you can just throw your dots on and leave them running. And everything will just fire out of the air. You have fireballs coming in from the sky, you've got fireballs coming from you, they're coming out of the ground, you've got budgies, you've got all manner of different stuff going on. Really, really fun build. And again, you can use it in any content you like. Now, firstly, thank you all very, very much for watching. I hugely appreciate your support. If you are not subscribed on YouTube, please do hit that button. It's free. Furthermore, if you want to help support out of the channel, there are some links in the info section for Patreon, Twitter, Facebook, and of course, the website, zynodegaming.com, where all the written guides are, including this one. Don't forget, of course, in the description as well, there are some links to some of the newer player tutorials that were also mentioned in this video. Once again, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.